Hello, everyone, and welcome back to DBR on CBR. That is right. It is time once again for Dragon Ball Rewatch. If you are watching along with us, make sure you are watching on Hulu or Crunchyroll. And if you're reading along with us, you can pick up the official translation by Viz Media. We are your hosts once again. My name is Alex. And I'm Sam. And I'm John. And yeah, this week, episode 12, A Wish to the Eternal Dragon, aired in Japan, May 14th, 1986. In, in America, November 25th, 1995, approaching Christmas, adapting two chapters, just one wish and full moon. Though very little of full moon. Plot's pretty simple. p uh tries to make his wish. Things go terribly wrong. And then Goku learns something he probably would rather not have learned. Well, I, don't think, I don't think anybody wanted to learn that. Well, I want to point this out. I don't think Goku learned it. <laughs> like, Goku no. definitely didn't learn it. Oh, the, the whole thing. This is Goku's great eight transformation. And it's, it's right at the end of the episode. But it's I forgot how quickly the gang put it together. Yeah. Like they just immediately, when Goku starts talking about this, they just go, oh, it's got to be you. Right. Uh, there had been running jokes and stuff in the first preceding 11 episodes of just how weird Goku is and what's the deal with your tail and stuff like that. And so, yeah, they're finally like, oh, this is what the deal is. This is the payoff episode. And also, I may have mentioned this in a previous episode, but this to me, singularly, is one of the worst things that Goku's friend group ever does to him. Because, spoiler alert, they don't tell Goku about this. And then they don't tell Goku that he's the one who definitely killed his grandfather. And then he has to find out from Vegeta. Yeah, this is the thing. Then you sit there going, how would you tell that to a kid? Like, yeah, this is... too, minus too long, maybe. <laughs> this is like, like this is one of those, definitely one of the bits I've gone back to where I'm like, as an adult, this is really sad. Like... You, Goku had one guy in his life and Goku killed him. And he couldn't have stopped it. Like, oh, that's really depressing. Also, the transformation Goku undergoes is very American werewolf in London. Yeah. And it's very body horror. Like, it's definitely pushing, I think, the limit of I, what you can get away with. I love when transformations look painful. Like, me, this is part of the, the horror movie buff in me. But the thing that I love about, like, the, like the old Lon Chaney werewolf stuff is that like stop motion motion of the muzzle and like the changes that they like American Werewolf in London does it. And I think that it adds more impact to a transformation when it looks like it's a physically a problem. Like, you know, Vincent Valentine in Final Fantasy VII is a really good example of that. And yeah. I love it here. Yeah, or like when you put on the transformation masks and Majora's Mask, you can hear the bones rearranging and stuff. Here you can it's like the heartbeat right you can hear it like start to pick up and grow as he expands outward into this uzaro this great ape similar to how roshi was transforming when we saw roshi transform is that he they spend a lot of time like non-proportional with certain limbs growing before other ones it really does pay off that this is this isn't something normal this is something very strange and it kind of sort of marks the viewer of you should be paying attention right now this is important yeah yeah, like, it's very important. Yeah. And it it's so... The slow dawning horror in Bulma and Yamcha and that and the whole group as they are putting those pieces together, that moment of relief when it doesn't hit immediately and then it goes into... Like, that is a... That's a horror movie setup. Like, that is the setup you would find in a horror movie. And it works really well here because it contrasts so much with everything that comes before it. Yeah, yeah. I how um maybe not tactful was Bulma to point and say, "Don't look at the moon; <laughs> it's right behind you." Yeah, Bulma failed psychology one hundred and one, <laughs> especially knowing Goku. Right? He'd be like, what? "Immediately, he's gonna look." Yeah. Uh, <sighs> the uh, this, yeah, this episode is scarier. It's definitely got a lot of even like the trap Pilaf has for them. It it's still that childish sadism thing but it's crossing that line slightly beyond it to where it does feel like, oh, this isn't as fun anymore. This is definitely... Stakes are real. It, yeah. Did, since we are talking about Pilaf, did he make a Doctor Who reference? Yes, he did the exterminate, exterminate in a Dalek voice. Very clearly a Dalek voice. <laughs> okay, I'm making sure that... To be that fair, that he never. does look a bit like the Daleks, the, the actual creature inside the Dalek. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> tentacles and all, but the um, 
the wolf sequence is something created specifically for the anime. You know, there's no big wolf fight where Yamcha gets to use his wolf fang fist against he little wolves. Literally, <laughs> literally and figuratively, he uses a wolf oh. as a fang fist here. <laughs> yeah, I love this because this is um, Shu summons the dog police, as he calls them. And this caught me off guard because the dog police are just Dobermans. Yeah. You think, oh, they're going to be shoes. No, but does this mean, to, to call back to a lot of episodes ago, are these the dog shoe is taking to obedience school? I, I assume. I mean, it's also, Dragon Ball has never been kind of like, like what constitutes like a anthropomorphic, sentient, fully sentient animal and what constitutes a feral animal? <laughs> this, is the, this is the Pluto and Goofy scenario. Like... What is Pluto and what is Goofy? Like, th there are questions to be asked here. I'm not one to say you wouldn't get, you couldn't make this on TV today. But I do think if you walked into Cartoon Network's office to have a meeting and they went, what happens in the episode? And you went, the heroes kill a lot of dogs. Monster dogs? No, just normal dogs. I don't think they would make it. I think they'd <laughs> go, get out. Security, yeah, yeah. come in, please. Because, yeah. yeah, they just crush one under a table. Like Yamcha shows no qualms. Like, that's a dog. I'm going to punch that dog. <laughs> he he literally me. picks one up and beats another dog with a dog. There is something so disrespectful about it. And I kind like this. It's some good, hilarious Yamcha action. It is a very funny visual. Yeah. We have to talk about the wish. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Right. Yeah, so Oolong charges in and uh, demands, well, what he demands will depend exactly on what version you're watching. Or reading. <laughs> or reading, yeah. So it will change. In this one, he demands the world's most comfortable pair of underwear. Yes, which is see foreshadowed in the preceding episode. During the pinball chase, he gets so scared or exasperated. He's like, I really need a new pair of, I need to change my underwear. And it's just like, okay. And he even mentions it when they get put in the in the oven room, I guess, for lack of a better term. He's like, oh, man, I need, still need to change my underwear, meaning I don't know if he pissed himself or whatever. Maybe. He um, said that his boxers were chafing as he was running towards the dragon because he's like, I'm not a hero. I just want to go home. I mean, Bulma has been making him literally um, evacuate his bowels on command for like the last three days. So... That would probably demand a change. There could be some spillage, but the, um, yeah, it's much less utilitarian in the manga and original Japanese uh, translation. Does he want a hot babe's underwear? Do, do you want me to get the sign? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, this hasn't dated well, but what I quite like is that in the BLT dub, they try and fix this problem to hide that it's a girl's underwear because the, the panties have a bow on them. By putting a Shenron on them, there's like a they they CG a little Shenron over the bow, which I actually really like. So I love the idea that these panties are like Shenron's equivalent of YouTuber merch. <laughs> like, sure, you'll get your panties, but I have to push the Shenron brand. So they're Shenron branded panties. I, yeah, I do think we need to talk a little bit about Shenron too, the interaction with Pilaf, and also the design of Shenron as the Eternal Dragon. I think we we got to talk about that because I Shenron is such an iconic visual now but like this is one of the first times you would see him fully realized on screen he looks much more classical like classical art in this because he's not as big and twisting he does look like something you would see in sort of like a wood carving he's also just very moody in this he's very upset with pilaf which i quite like hurry it up man i want to go back to sleep yeah yeah for at least a year uh <laughs> he works one day a year this is how he acts yeah you know He's on, he's on the clock. Um, yeah, the idea, that, the idea that if Pilaf was any more confident, brave, or any or assertive, he could have got exactly what he wanted, but he isn't. And so a shape-shifting pig zips in <laughs> to get underpants instead. Uh, and I, I love the reaction that, like, he's clearly about to say it. And out of, and as far as he's concerned, out of nowhere, this pig appears next to him. It's just like the most comfortable pair of underwear. <laughs> and just like the look of shock on Pilaf, Shu and Mai's face when they realize everything they worked for has just gone up in a pair of cotton. I especially love it, like knowing as we know later that you sort of pick up that Shenron is, will change wishes and will help you make wishes which carries the implication that he was so annoyed with Pilaf. Like, he knew that wasn't the person making the wish, but he hated Pilaf just so much. He's like, sure, whatever. 
Because <laughs> we've seen that Shenron will be like, oh, I can't do that, but I can do this. So he made the conscious choice to give Ulon the wish, not Pilaf, based on later uh, later incidents. Sh- Shenron, much like Kami, can be super petty. <laughs> In terms of exposition, is this the first time where we get the explanation that the Dragon Balls need a year to regenerate? I believe, yeah, I think I so. Think, I, th- I think it is. Which again opens up Goku's reaction to that is really sad as well. It's like, oh, that's my last thing, and my grandfather's gone. It's another also, sad little moment. Also, how does Bulma know all this? <laughs> she's very well read. I mean, that, it's kind of she. We the first time we see her, she's like she knows all about the Dragon Balls. She's already got multiple of them. I, I just assume someone as smart as Bulma has done her quite a bit of research because <laughs> she, she's got the Dragon Radar, so she must have worked out how to kind of how they work on some level. She knows the radioactive signature of the dragon. It's such an interesting thing to think about the interaction of technology and magic. And the the show never really like goes into it, but it is something that pro- crops up in other media where how do you interact technology and magic? And this is one where it's like, it just works. Don't ask questions. Yeah. Also, a fun thing about this wish is it sets up two things, which is kind of interesting, is that uh, Oolong's technique here is what Bulma will start using in Super of just gather the balls, wish for anything, we set them for a year. Just making, because she wishes for like less cellulite and to be slimmer, just to keep the balls continually a stone, which <laughs> she clearly saw Oolong do here and has sort of stolen as her move. That that joke later on in Super, especially in Dragon Ball Super Broly, is to me the perfect culmination of Bulma's character. She started out with like a, a super shallow wish and she makes them more shallow. But it's also perfectly logical, because, yeah, if you just keep resetting them, no one can use them, and you've cut off half your problems. Also, hilariously, this is our first Dragon Ball GT setup, because Oolong has just given birth to Oceana Shenron. That's right. So, see that playoff in 33 years? 33 years. 10, right? Because, well, I mean, like you were saying, this premiered oh, in 86. I got my, I got my <laughs> dates mixed up. Yeah, it would be about 10, 15. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought we were talking about in universe. In universe, <laughs> sure. In universe, yeah. Um, the idea that the shadow dragons are all start with Oolong's wish for underpants. Um, <laughs> well, we knew Oolong would doom the universe. It just was going to take some time. Yeah, I. That's the shadow dragon is probably my favorite thing in GT because it's a direct callback to the entire history of Dragon Ball and um, sets up really interesting villains that I don't think you know i was never the biggest baby fan <laughs> but um that's a decade off the yeah, wait uh, until you get to talk about the tuffles yeah yeah but the uh planet plant um yeah i mean I, this is another episode where they kind of draw out the the peel off sagas climax as long as they possibly can I love the cliffhanger of, of, I mean, the last two cliffhangers were great. The emergence of Shenron and the uh, Goku's great ape transformation. <laughs> and the little stinger at the end where he turns back to the camera. Just that to is for one so yeah. well done. And it, I'm I'm not ashamed to admit that caught me. Even after Shenron last episode caught me, that caught me. It's like, oh, wow. It definitely does give that sort of moment of, again, got to tune in next week because this is big. You're not going to want to miss this. My thing is, they try to break out through the walls. Why don't they try to break out from the ceiling? They do mention that it is tempered glass when Goku tries to go and headbutt the glass and he gets his little Looney Tune moment, but apparently his head is not hard enough, so I don't know whose would be. I, I, I think they may have um, confused tempered glass with something else because, yeah, <laughs> tempered glass isn't that strong. I guess they didn't want to come up with another line like the double-lined walls we had previously, so it's just... yeah. Crazy. Maybe it's... maybe Kamehameha wave. Maybe Kamehameha wave would do it. <laughs> oh, Goku. Oh, well, I mean, he did try. Did Gachi? Because when Yamcha throws Goku, he tells him that food's up, and then Yamcha, uh, Goku does the Looney Tunes seeing the person as meat. Did he eat then, that dog? Then we cut away. Does has he eaten? Has he eaten the dog? I mean, he's hungry when when they are re imprisoned. So I don't think so. I guess Mai and Shu got to Bulma before Goku could actually eat a dog. Yeah. Again, Just imagine going catch... into an office and pitching that today. They catch the they catch Goku right as he's about to bite into this dog. Yeah, slowly putting it down. The Cartoon Network guy pressing the button under his desk for security rapidly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We cannot greenlight this series. We are good. We're <laughs> going to point out sued by the ASPCA. Yeah. For 
more weird Pilaf law in this episode. Lots more weird Pilaf law. How Wait. Pilaf suddenly just doesn't give a crap about not having his wish nearly two scenes afterwards because you see them playing cards and having coffee together. Everyone's really chill. Then they go to bed in their shared room. <laughs> The shared room also makes a lot of questions come up. Like you said last episode, are they Pilaf's children? Did he adopt these adults? Why are they all sharing a room? What is happening here? This is all confusing. I think it's the only power structure he knows. The only power dynamic he knows. He's never probably had a relationship. He's never probably had a boss. He's just knows the... We already know he has a probably unresolved issues with a maternal figure. It's probably like he probably bases everything on a parent-child relationship through that. I love their little seven dwarves beds, by the way. (laughs) Yeah, they each have their own little bed and it's like really cute. I'm like, that's adorable. But again, you're planning to execute some people tomorrow, but it's still cute. And they're and they're not even like junky little beds that you would put like a henchman in. They're cle- they're like nice wooden beds that they that they have. Like it it's so weird. It's also really when you when they're doing the cards thing. They have like a very normal, like, I guess that's the break room because they're just using a folding table. They have like a very normal coffee pot. So they have like this big, like, technological room with the piano that controls the ball and the Dragon Ball detector. And then just this regular, like, I work in retail break room where they play cards and then the Snow White bedroom. Yeah. They, to be fair, Pilas Castle's layout because we now know that, that not only are there crocodiles in the, in the, in the roof. From earlier, there are dogs walking freely in the walls, ceiling, and floor. And there's Tetris rooms. There's the, and I mentioned as much last episode. I really want to see like blueprints of this place because it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> the closest you'll get is in. Castle makes more sense. Is yeah. in the, it is a map in Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure where you do get to punch the dogs as well. I need to get Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure then. It, it's yeah. not a Dragon Ball game until you've punched some kind of dog. A lot of Dragon Ball, like the RPG ones, you punch a lot of dogs in Dragon Ball games. Yeah, yeah. I think about like Legacy of Goku and all the things. I remember and I think it's Legacy of Goku 1, you punch the um, cloud souls in the other world. And it's just like, why? They're already dead. Oh yeah, there's just a lot of needless punching in those games. Yeah. But, also, um, one thing I do like, we're going to go to Goku when he's talking about the legend his grandpa told him. There's a fun continuity issue introduced into, into this dub and one of the previous dubs where Goku mentions that they crushed his house. The monster crushed his house, which, no, we saw Goku's house in the first episode, totally uncrushed. Did he rebuild it? I don't think so, because he said that he's been living there and he's still got all his grandpa's stuff in there when you walk around. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think Goku would have set up a table and chairs. He doesn't seem the type. He doesn't strike me as someone that is a particularly skilled carpenter, but uh, he could prove me wrong. <laughs> Something That's else a side clear story. Up. I want to clear this up from like last week's episode two. We were kind of debating what gender poir is because Bulma straight up calls, uses uh, female pronouns to describe poir, to order poir. And I was reading an interview in with uh, Akira Toriyama, the series creator, that you can read at the um, in the back, the liner notes of volume two of the original manga. He uses male pronouns for Poir. So really, Poir is whatever gender you want Poir to be. Shapeshifters. They're just like... Loki situation. <laughs> and, and again, in this episode, Poir transforms into a really cute bird. So you got to you got to think talking about uh Ozuru Goku again. Um you got to think like what what do you think the reaction was when you saw this for the first time? Like all of a sudden this little kid's a giant monkey. Like when when you first see that moment. Like what like I, See, I remember, I, I remember as a kid I was terrified. Like because this feels like such a bad ending. The heroes do not win. They don't Pilaf doesn't win, but Goku has lost. And now it's like, oh, this this little kid you've been supporting, he's a horrific monster that has a body count. I was scared of this episode as a child. You know, Great Apes, having started with DBZ before Dragon Ball, I mean, and having seen like Gohan and Vegeta do it, it's always a question of like, for me, in terms of power scaling, like, how are you at your Dragon Ball power levels going to stop this? And we see how, I mean, it's, but yeah, it was always, because it, it was all hands on deck when Gohan and Vegeta did it in DBZ. So it's like, Yamcha can't do even do energy attacks or fly yet. <laughs> What's he going to do? <laughs> Yamcha's got one attack and it's not going to work in this situation. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's he funny you ask. Knowing Yamcha, he would probably still try. Oh, he'll he'll <laughs> try, and we lo- and we love him for it. We we, we, we appreciate do. his work ethic. But I, it's I funny think... you. Ooh, I go. think this has become the Yamcha Appreciation Podcast. Uh, <laughs> I am loving him much more than I did when I first watched it. Just because of how great Sabat is, he's playing him so well. I'm having so much fun with him. It's We have to enjoy it while we can, because we know it's coming. We, we know it's ending soon. <laughs> but it is funny you mentioned that uh, how people reacted, because I got curious about that as well. So I've done some digging. Um, I've brought you a little treat. I've been going through old anime sort of fanzines, magazines, and uh, forums from sort of 1995 and 1995 to see what people said. And I've brought a few quotes along because some of these are great. Um, You'll have... So let me just pull my notes. So I'm going to want to quote these. So a lot of these come from rec.arts.anime. It's uh, one of the earliest anime BBSs that's still uh, searchable. Uh, So this has posts going all the way back to 1992. Oh, cool. There are some well, earlier forums in that for anime, but you, of, because of how old forum software is, a lot of them aren't backed up. So one of the ones I have for you is, uh, this is titled DB Question, hosted by someone called Overlord on December 4th, 1995. They say, just saw last week's DB episode where Goku turns into a giant monster because he stares into the moonlight. Did I miss something here? Since when did he have this little problem? And does he still have this ability when he gets older? And the first response is, in the next episode, you'll see... When they cut off Goku's tail, he'll turn back to his normal self. So it seems the tail is an important aspect in Goku turning into a giant were monkey. The real detailed explanation won't be explained until the anime reaches DBZ. Vegeta will explain the whole thing to you. Yeah. What I really like looking through this is um, actually I'm gonna do the next one. And someone immediately replied to that afterwards is yes, you missed the part where Akira Toriyama pulled this plot complication out of a hat. <laughs> it sounds about right. <laughs> what I loved when I was going through these is that you do see this just dis- definite split between the people who are currently watching Z, who love it because they say it, they're just like, oh, it's foreshadowing Vegeta. It's, it's complete foreshadow. And the people who are just starting with Dragon Ball, who all seemingly hated this twist. <laughs> so That's many of them are ranting about it. And you get to the, obviously you get the people who are like, oh, I watched Dragon Ball years ago because they put, imported the laser discs. So uh, December 6, 1995, uh, Battle Angel user posted even more DB questions. This is This is great. The episode where Goku turns into that monster is still freaking me out. I now know that he's an alien and the moon turns him into a beast. Why? And I know he eventually loses his tail when he gets older. When does that happen? And when does he turn into that mean looking guy with the spiky blonde hair? What was his (laughs) name again? Super Duper Saiyan Goku. Please forgive my ignorance. I've just started getting into Dragon Ball sagas and I need all the help I can get. Also, is it just me or are Bulma's rapid mood swings just a little creepy? I mean, you're uh, not wrong. <laughs> the, the response I love to this is some a uh, guy called Burl Harris, and if you're listening, please reach out to me because I'm about to insult you, sort of took part in the anime online American anime fan community's most treasured of traditions, the spreading of the misinformation. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm sort of new to this whole Dragon Ball thing myself, but here's what I know. Goku doesn't lose his tail. He just wears it inside his pants when he starts growing because it's embarrassing. Much later in the show, Goku becomes a super Saiyajin. This is a level of martial arts mastery far beyond that of any mortal monkey. (laughs) When he transforms, the massive chi output bleaches his hair and causes it to spike upwards. He also gains immense power from this, such as massive fireballs, flight, and the ability to blow up entire planets. Hope this helps a little. I mean, there's some truth there. (laughs) There's some truth. Here's the thing. I know that Google Translate didn't exist at this point in time, but for something about that reads like Google Translate. There's a lot of weird typing in this. I will I will give credit to people who made this. It might be some some broken words, maybe because of the backup not being great. Because like they were using like smileys on here that I just don't have. They're just boxes for me because the software's changed. But one thing I really want to point out is a really interesting thing I noticed doing this is that we know if you're watching on American TV. Next episode is being portrayed as the season finale. Yes. Which is true. If you brought the original Dragon Ball DVDs, we end next episode. Yeah. And everyone is debating if the show is coming back. And most people are saying it's not. And a lot of people are just sort of complaining that, uh, well, the thing that's most of this episode is that people are saying that, one, it's not coming back. And two, they're surprised that Oolong's panties were left in. Those <laughs> are the two things people put in the episode. Donny Chan, uh, Posted the whole thread saying, after months of suspense, I'm surprised the North American Dragon Ball TV series kept the panties on Oolong's head. 
And then this applied to someone who has the wonderful nickname of scam at netcom.com. That email address does not work anymore. I did check. You know what's even more astounding? They kept in the part about Goku killing his grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's a post ocean world, man. We're, and, we're, we're afraid to go, not afraid to go into that. We were just talking about all those points, which I think is actually kind of funny. I love that you did this, by the way, John, because number oh. one, it shows the dedication. And number two, I love the archaeology. Like, this is, this is a kind of internet archaeology right here. Like, oh, this is. You'll, I'll be coming back to this at certain points because there are some very interesting things. Yeah, but it's really interesting. Most of the complaints were about dub issues. One of my favorites was a later thread where someone pointed out, because a big thing you'd see is that people would say, what the hell's going on with the Great Eight? And yeah. then everyone would explain the entire plot of Dragon Ball Z to them. They're like, oh, just wait for Vegeta. That's how many <laughs> episodes away? Oh, So if someone <laughs> yeah. responds to one of the early stretches, patience, my friend, all things will be explained. Unless the US version gets so chopped up that none of these things are ever mentioned or the show gets cancelled. And then the later response, yeah, you're never going to learn because it won't be renewed. <laughs> wow. It's on you, person from 30 years ago. It's I mean, on this you. Is, this you is a huge wrong. tonal shift, I will say, compared to everything we've seen so far. It really oh. is. And um, yeah, there's, there's, there's so many things about the panties in the dub. It's great. I was, I would read, I read about 100 posts of people complaining about fat panty edits. But I also found one other thing, which I think is really interesting. It's going to be sort of my ending point, is uh, Animerica magazine. It was an old magazine that used to run for anime. So December 1995, they ran an article called Anime Then and Now, comparing American anime from 1995 to sort of the 80s. So obviously, the, um, I think Annie, Animerica was one of those magazines that had the uh, was always a month ahead. So this was written before the episode came out. I think it's really interesting how they describe the dub. Though an evergreen hit in Asian markets worldwide, Dragon Ball was considered too difficult to import to the US because of its continual violence, casual nudity, and distinctly ethnic source material. Again, I am quoting from them here. With its traditional Monkey King Legend of China Foundation. But in an era of, in an era of John Woo's hard-boiled and the teenage mutant Ninja Turtles, neither do the violence nor the cultural slant raise anywhere near the same eyebrows it would have 10 years ago. And with the simple technological wave of digital retouching, the frequently occurring nudity is now reduced to merely a troublesome detail, rather than a frustrating impasse. Dragon Ball, like Sailor Moon, is a hopeful sign that more anime on TV is the wave of the future. One, they were right, but two, it's really interesting to see them being like, actually, all the edits are great because we get the show when the fan community were just raging about them. It's such an interesting dynamic. Just to give like a, this will be kind of part of my ending point too. The interesting thing about it is that television cultural shifts in America are so mired in their time period. Because if you think the one of the biggest American cultural shifts in television was Star Trek. Like oh. you, you can't talk, you can't have stuff like this on TV without it, you know. And that was such a such a rallying cry for changes in television because of Lucille Ball saving the show and because of, you know, the first, like one of the most diverse casts on television. In a weird way, it paved the way for more diversity of programming on television. And you can kind of see Dragon Ball doing a similar thing in America along with Sailor Moon. After that, when I was a kid, it was really lame to be into anime. And now everyone's into it. There are rap songs about Goku. There are hundreds of rap songs about Goku. And I, this shifted the culture. Oh, yeah. And I, I find it really funny for the Annie uh, America article, how they mentioned the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles being this softening force. Because I grew up in the UK where we didn't have the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We had the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles because the <laughs> censors would not allow the word ninja to be used on television. So it's, it's really how the, the two things they cite are hard-boiled, which that's the movie children watch, I presume. Of course. And Ninja <laughs> course. Turtles. But you're right. This is sort of a point where anime is becoming a thing. And it's only, they're, they're right, it's only going to be up from here. Like, like because even before, there was anime on television before then, but it was Speed Racer. It was, it was Astro, Astro Boy. Boy. Yeah. It was things that they kind of ripped to shreds and changed. And Tezuka got away with it because he had more of a Disney style. Now, Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball literally changed the Western world at this point. And I think it's very interesting. Oh, yeah. So, as I said, it's amazing when you go back to this post from 1995, and there are thousands of these threads with hundreds of posts in them each of people sharing the times to watch what local network it's on and 
sharing it. Like one person in this mentions that they went to a party to watch this episode because okay. someone had, uh, I think, I believe, a satellite decoder so they could get non-local channels. So yeah, the anime community isn't a new thing. It's yeah. just very, and it's arguing about the same things it has since 1995. Every fandom, man. <laughs> Every fandom. Every fandom gets into these circuitous arguments. But on that note, we're just about on it on time. Does anybody have any real quick thoughts before we sign off? I have one, and it's one of my final quote. Uh, it's from a guy called Matthew Summer. You're a man after my own heart, whose complaint about the oolong panties being CG changed was, I only watch Funimation's dub because I like seeing the stupid edits they come up with. I kind of wish they'd turn them into a cowboy hat or something. Would man it? after my own heart. <laughs> well, I, I can't follow up on that. <laughs> We're about to see, you know, this uh, the Emperor Peel Off saga end next week, and which is wild. It ends close out the first story arc of Dragon Ball Anything. In the meantime, be sure to you know follow along on Crunchyroll and Hulu. This has been another, or if you're reading, you know, read the manga through Viz Media. This has been another Dragon Ball rewatch here on CBR. I'm Sam. I'm John. And I'm Alex. And we'll see you next time on Dragon Ball. Mm-hmm.